far left radical. You know what really bothers me about Tim Waltz as a Marine who served his country in uniform? When the United States Marine Corps, when the United States of America asked me to go to Iraq to serve my country, I did it. I did what they asked me to do it, and I did it honorably, and I'm very proud of that service. When Tim Waltz was asked by his country to go to Iraq, you know what he did? He dropped out of the army and allowed his unit to go without him, a fact that he's been criticized for aggressively by a lot of the people that he served with. I think it's shameful to prepare your unit to go to Iraq to make a promise that you're gonna follow through and then to drop out right before you actually have to go. I also think it's dishonest. Something, again, if you guys ever get an opportunity to ask Tim Waltz or Kamala Harris some questions, he made this interesting comment that the Kamala Harris campaign put out there, and I bet they're regretting they put it out there now, because he said that we, and he was making a point about gun control, he said we shouldn't allow weapons that I used in war to be on America's streets. Well, I wonder, Tim Waltz, when were you ever in war? When was this, what was this weapon that you carried into war given that you abandoned your unit right before they went to Iraq and he has not spent a day in a combat zone? That's where this started. That's where these disgusting stolen valor accusations started. J.D. Vance, the Republican nominee for vice president, standing in a press conference and when asked about Tim Waltz's politics, his politics, J.D. Vance chose to attack his military service. J.D. Vance, who served just four years in the Marine Corps and did deploy to Iraq at Al-Assad airspace, fine. But the idea that his go-to position when asked about Tim Waltz's performance as a Democratic legislator and governor, his first reaction was to go and attack his service. It's disgusting. So when they try to gaslight you that we started this or Tim Waltz is the problem, the fact is J.D. Vance started this by attacking a veteran service, 24 years in the National Guard. So I don't want to hear this bullshit. But here's the most disgusting part, folks. The most disgusting part of this whole conversation is that J.D. Vance has thrown away his ethics and morals and his honor code to the Army and the, excuse me, the Marine Corps, threw it all out for this fucking guy. I supported him for president. I raised a million dollars for him. It's a lot of money. I supported him. He lost. He let us down. But, you know, he lost. So I never liked him as much after that because I don't like losers. <laughs> But, but Frank, he's Frank, let me get hero. to it. He's he a hit war me. Hero. He's not a, a war hero. He's a war hero. He's a war Five hero. And a half years he's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. Do you he's agree with hero. that? He's a war hero because he was captured, okay? You can have, and I believe perhaps he's a war hero, but, but right now he said some very bad things about a lot of people. So what I said is John McCain. I disagree with him that these people aren't crazy. And, very importantly, and I speak the truth, he graduated last in his class at Annapolis. So I said, nobody knows that. I said he graduated last or second to last. He graduated last in his class at Annapolis. And he was upset. I said, why, for telling the truth? See, you're not supposed to say that somebody graduated last or second to last in their class, because you're supposed to be like Frank says, very nice. Folks. Yeah. That's July of 2015, when Donald J. Trump sat at a Family Values Christian conference and attacked John McCain and said, I like people that weren't captured. He smeared everyone who ever served as MIA or POW. A man who never served a day in his life, took five draft departments, played college tennis, and then said he had bone spurs and couldn't go to Vietnam. And then had the audacity to go on TV and radio for years later saying his Vietnam was avoiding STDs in New York in the 80s. So I don't want to hear any bullshit from J.D. Vance about whose service was honorable when he chose to serve the most despicable man to ever cross the threshold of the United States government in the White House. So, so spare me the fucking bullshit. Now, why is all this happening? It's simple, folks. Politics. You see, Tim Waltz had the audacity to be a Democrat in 2004. Tim Waltz had the audacity to retire from the National Guard, to oppose the Iraq War, and then to run for Congress as a Democrat. When, in the old days, if you forget them, you're either for us or against us. You're with us or against us. And that went to everything. Now, how do I know this is really all about politics? Because the main accuser who's been riding this train for about 16 years, a guy named Barron's, 
This is what he just recently posted to Facebook. Now look at this screenshot. We're going to blow it up the whole screen, the whole screen. Look at this screenshot of a Facebook post. Look at the disgusting, homophobic, disgusting things that a sergeant major who served the United States Army, who actually had soldiers that were likely gay or for certainly POC, this is his attitude. So don't don't tell me that he's being Tim Wallace is being attacked because of his because of his service or that the people attack him because they have to protect the honor of their service, the oath to the constitution. When they put up shit like this, that's homophobic and bigoted and disgusting. This is one reason they're doing this folks, politics. This is MAGA attacking a decent, decent man. So I thought, let's talk about that. And I got the perfect guest who knows more about Democratic veterans policy than almost anybody I know because he's been doing it for almost three decades. So let's get on with the show. You know me. I'm Fred Wellman. This is On Democracy FP1 right here on the Mize Touch Network, the On Democracy Podcast YouTube channel, wherever you get your podcast. This is the place. Let's get on with the show. Welcome, 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 welcome to Automize the FP Wellman. I am Fred Wellman, same as I was 30 seconds ago before the music. I am so excited for this week's show. You're in the right place right here on the Midas Touch Network, On Democracy Podcast, YouTube, Apple, wherever you get your stuff. Be sure you subscribe. We've got a lot of cool content coming up. You may have heard I'll be at the DNC next week. A lot of original content to go there, which is why I've got our guests this week. You know, it's been a crazy, crazy week. We've been arguing about stolen valor now for a week and a half. On top of that, I'm constantly being accosted by Trump supporters, sadly many independents too, with the stupid and mythical idea that Democrats are anti-military or have actually hurt veterans and nothing could be further from the truth. So I thought it was time to tackle all those things with someone who's been involved in the Democratic veterans policy for decades. My friend from Virginia and fellow West Point graduate, I might add, he's got the shirt on, Taryn Sims. Taryn's a West Point graduate, Army Iraq veteran, spent three decades or so supporting Democratic efforts to support veterans, and is currently, most importantly, the co-chair of the Veterans and Military Families Council of the Democratic National Committee. Taryn, welcome to the My Touch Network. It's great to see you, brother. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, good to have me. Thank you, man. Man, I love this. I've been wanting to get you on for a while. I'm going to see you in Chicago next week. It's so exciting. You know, I opened with a couple of clips. I opened the clip of J.D. Vance teeing off on on, on Tim Waltz's service uh, in a press yep. conference. And it wasn't just some off thing. He, he had a plan to fucking attack him. It was disgusting. You know, now they're all playing victims like they didn't open that. They opened this battle. Um you know, it's been a week and a half since he decided to attack a service. It, 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 I mean, you're a veteran. I'm a veteran. You know, one of the rules we, we, we try not to attack a chair of service. Isn't, this is crazy, isn't it? It's, it's ridiculous. And I had posted on my Facebook page when this stuff was getting noisy. And I generally don't get political on my Facebook page. Yeah. Uh, but I said veterans don't question other veteran service, right? right? And that obviously implies a whole lot of things. But the general thing is if I meet another veteran, I'm not checking you. Right. right? I'm not. I'm not trying to say, oh, are you more veteran than me? Or um, did you do real combat in, instead of my combat? Or if we were both in Iraq, did you leave your father camp every day? And if you did, you know, I don't care about that, right? I, I honestly don't even care what your discharge was. Because as we know, across the decades, there are various reasons why people weren't honorably discharged. Exactly. For bullcrap friggin' reasons, whether it's racial, whether it's because of who they love, whether because they had post-traumatic stress and they smoked some weed to yep. try to get down and then they pissed hot and had to get kicked out, you name it, right? And so unless you did something super egregious, right, I don't care. Right? As long as you friggin' serve, to yep. me, that's all that matters. And so when I when when I come across folks, and you put party, put party politics aside, when I come across folks who are challenging other veterans on on how veteran they are, it, it, it really does piss me off. Exactly. And and it's and especially since it's an all volunteer force since Vietnam, right? Everyone who served stepped up and volunteered to serve their country. At any given time, less than one percent of our country's serving, less than a, a third are even allowed to serve physically. And so right. it is a big deal. We're down, I think we're down to less than seven percent of our population even serves at all as a veteran veterans at all. We're not even veterans. So so to to see this kind of attack on someone who's gave 24 years of his life uh to serve our country. Now, a lot of our viewers may not understand the nuances of this 
thing without getting too far down in the weeds. And right. we can talk timelines and all this stuff later. But but I want to talk about especially, and I saw a great conversation on our show, but I don't know if our viewers here, a lot of them aren't military veterans. How big of a deal is a command sergeant major? Right? I mean, you know, right. I mean, it's, it's an important job, but by the same token, yeah. less than 1% of everyone who enlists in the army as a soldier, as a private, whatever, makes it all the rank of command sergeant major. It's, it's a, it's a hell of an accomplishment for Tim Walsh to ever have reached that point, isn't it? It, it is. And more so to your point, as people believe or, or could understand, even, more to the point because he was in the guard and for right. anyone who even has some similar understanding of how rank progression works in the guard. And that is kind of the reason why we're even having this ridiculous conversation to begin with There's only so many slots in the guard. Yeah. And so for him to make that, to, to, to achieve that position and at least hold the rank while he was in the queue to go to the Sergeant Major's Academy is even more of an accomplishment than if he were uh, in the regular army. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for those who understand, every unit, uh, so the way the military works, if you understand, is like, uh, we were both officers, right? And so from every, from my very first job, I was 22 years old, I got out of the Ar got out of West Point, ended up in Korea as an Air Scout platoon leader, and my right-hand guy was a sergeant first class, or actually staff sergeant at that time, who was my platoon sergeant. I was a platoon leader, he was a platoon sergeant. He ran the soldiers, and in the aviation, he made sure my aircraft were fixed, he made sure my soldiers were taken care of. And this goes throughout your ranks. As a company, you got the first sergeant at battalion is when you have your first command sergeant major who is the right hand man of the battalion commander lieutenant colonel who is the commander and this goes all the way up to all the way now all the way to the chair of the joint chiefs has the senior enlisted advisor the command the chief uh, you know uh, the SEAC we call him who's also a command sergeant major of one of the services this is a very big deal on the enlisted side to become a command sergeant major and it was a very important job when Tim did it and I think I don't think a lot of people understand just how remarkable it is and by the way you're right 24 years in to get that job is actually a short time, believe it or not. <laughs> and it tells you, I mean, I, my understanding is he did, he did a, he did your standard National Guard tours. He, he fought fires yeah. in Yosemite, right? I think they did flood relief. I mean, they've done all those things short of combat, didn't they? Well, and yeah. And, you know, and God bless Patrick Murphy for being the loudest one um, to go public on this. He had to explain to folks and most people understand when, when you support uh, or deploy to support OEF or OIF, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to Iraq and Afghanistan. Correct. So he did deploy with his battalion to Italy in support of Operation Enduring Freedom to to lead in whatever training operations were going on um, for those forces that were deploying to uh, deploy in Afghanistan. And as we all know in the Army, you don't have a choice of where you're deploying. Nope. Right? If you get orders to deploy, you order to deploy, period. Yep. And so he actually has also done an actual deployment in support of combat operations. Yep. Yep. And that's really key. Um, you know, it's funny when I, after 9-11, uh, I got, so I don't know if I've talked about much on the show, but I was a reservist on 9-11. I'd gotten out of the army in May of 2000. Um, I was actually running for mayor of Peachtree City, Georgia. That's a story for another day. <laughs> and, and when 9-11 hit, I was in Atlanta and I was serving as a staff officer, an augmentation staff officer of Forces Command, which is the headquarters that is in charge of all yeah, U.S. forces, yeah. right? And so my first job after they figured out that I used to be working for Third Army <laughs> was they put me in a secure vault this is true i love this they put me in a secure vault the tech this the, the skiff that they call the the tactical what yeah. it is. I, I was in the secure facility <laughs> and, and they gave me a little tiny desk next to their printer <laughs> and my job believe it or not was to look at all the unit readiness across the arc active army national guard and reserve and select them for the various deployments based on their status and recommend those units and so the orders were very so i actually cut or was helping cut the orders for many of these units that first five, four or five months after 9 11 and the orders were very and this has been very this has been mucked up by our friends on the right his orders the orders we sent people out on even people in the united states like when we sent them to new york city to to support the operations after the fall of the twin towers those orders said in support of operation enduring freedom you know it right. does so so when he says i deployed in support of operation enduring freedom he's literally quoting the orders quoting which the, they were deploying the order. yeah it was, right. he's not everybody's like oh he's 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 gaslighting and he went to combat no that's literally no. what the order said right they backfilled the 173rd airborne in vicenza Inslee, italy which what you said was training up so they helped their training they pulled security on the base because we right. did up our security 
kidding me? The red There's cycle like, stuff that 173rd couldn't do. That's what they ended up having to do. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And and so I get really angry. People say, oh, well, he's he's gaslighting about actually deploying. No, they did. Their order said operation. So he did deployment. And by the way, his daughter, which he just had late because of IVF, they couldn't have children. Hope, we, we all know her now because they had there's wonderful videos of the two of them. Hope was just two years old when he deployed. You know, he right. left He left for, I think, six months to a year. That's hard. No matter where you go, being away from family, especially as a guardsman, is hard, right? And so I think people forget that. I've always gotten mad about that. The other part of that, the other, of course, the next one piece we talk about a lot is is this timeline of his retirement, right? You know, and, and it, it, people think you just retire quickly, don't you? Well, it's, it's ridiculous. And I had to put a 99 grad in his place. And he, <laughs> he hasn't responded because the response I gave to him was just classic. But um, as my brother and I were joking, my brother, no four grad, we were joking a couple of days ago and he called me as you and I know, Fred, anyone listening here who has been in the military, you cannot backdoor retirement. No. Like you cannot trick the army into retiring. No. And even if you like were to retire with orders coming, the army can bring you back. Yep. Right. So there isn't like this conspiracy of, oh, we're deploying. So let me drop my paperwork before the army can get me. No, it doesn't work that way. Just like though I'm going to go in right field. You'll understand this. If you were, if if, for people who don't know, if you're getting retirement pay, you're still subject to UCMJ. Right. So (laughs) nothing Tim Walls did was illegal, unethical, Definitely not immoral. Nope. It wasn't wrong. Him and probably three other, 3,000 other people dropped retirement paperwork yep. on the same day. And if the army did not want him to retire, they would have they would have revoked his retirement. Exactly. And yeah. you would have heard no complaining from him because he would have understood at that grade that he was in the needs of the army. I have a soldier who got stopped lost twice. Yeah. Poor kid. Yep. Wow. God, that's terrible. Yes. Oh my God. Went home. He was still on his leave. Um, we got our warno. They brought him back. Yep. After about a few weeks or a month, they said, you know what? You can go back home. But then we got our deployment orders. <laughs> And they brought them back. That's how it works. And and, and right. you're right. And and a lot of people are also comparing the later parts of the global war on terror to that. This is this is 2005. Okay, that was really people forget that was the early days of this thing. We were still figuring out the systems for for rolling people up. We weren't really throwing national guardians directly into the combat roles at that point. No. And, you know, I mean, we we were still kind of figuring it out. We, you know, so that's in peace. We were sending. Yeah. We're, yeah. We were yes. Yes. Where we got, yeah. Artillery and, reservists and guardsmen to MPs, but other than that. MP, maybe some yeah. aviation units because we we're wearing out our aircraft, that kind of thing, but certainly not line units. And this is before we sent artillery units with just with the rifles <laughs> to be to be patrols. You know, it was a very right. different time. So you didn't. Yeah, there may be rumors of deployments coming, but in those days, you didn't get like warning order, warning order, warning or deployment order. I mean, so they're trying to fluff the timeline and the timeline is very clear. He dropped. He, he, he it took at least five to nine months to retire. And so when he got out in May, they got their order, their first deployment order in July as well after he was gone. And then and, and, and so this whole thing and the way they're trying to fudge the timeline, like he snuck out or something like that has been really infuriating. I I retired. Uh, I, I I quit the army twice. <laughs> so, you know, I I I, I, you know, I, I did just keep. You know, I, so I'm one of the guys like Tim Waltz, who I left the army before 9/11. Um, it took me, gosh, it took me just to quit. I didn't retire. I just quit. It still took about uh, three months for me just to leave. Retirement took nine months for me. Yeah. Right. You know, it's a whole process at that point, point. and that was in 2010. So not long after. So so you don't just drop your papers and just sneak away. That's not how it works. And another right. part that's bothering me, and you'll appreciate this too, is one of the things that's made me angry. And I'll, I'll talk about the politics second. The first part is that the big attacker here, <clears throat> I think his name's Barons. He was the replacement sergeant major. It was a full 10 months after Tim Waltz left that they deployed, right? I mean, even for, for training, I think, wasn't it? If, they th- if I'm accurate yeah. by the timeline, right? So it's, it's it, you and I, I don't know if you guys did it, and I bring this up a lot online, is we had changes of command in Iraq, right? We did. <laughs> you know, and never missed a mission. So the idea that Tim Waltz retiring in 10 months before they even deployed somehow screwed the unit and they weren't ready to go because of that. No. I mean, you find that ridiculous, right? It's not even worth the conversation. That's what bothers me. I get it. I get regular people who, who've never served in any branch of the service, not getting it, but anyone who served at least three years, if they have an issue with this, it's, it's because they lean 
Right. They, they, they lean red in their politics and they just want to see this for political reasons. Because to your point, once we got to late June of 2003, um, yeah, one general, I forget who, well, DOD decided to allow us to start ETS and PCSing and retiring yep. in theater. Yep. So we're in theater. replacement bodies and replacement mm-hmm. leadership. Right, new platoon yep. leaders, new troop commanders, new squadron. But I got a new regimental commander. Yep, in Iraq. Yep. Right, Colonel Wolf, now retired General Wolf, replaced, um, stepped, you know, moved on, and Colonel May, now retired General May, replaced him as the commander of the regiment. Yep, that's that's what the deal was. And so, for anyone in the present to say that someone's abandoning the unit because the unit is getting ready to deploy. Um, they're speaking, they're speaking with the, with their political tongue because exactly. they know how the system works. Exactly. I mean, it's one thing I talk about a lot. We are trained from the, when we were cadets at West Point, you and I were cadets, we were trained from the very beginning and everyone's replaceable. The whole system we developed since the freaking revolutionary war was if like, somebody gets shot, somebody steps into the gate, right? That's the whole point. The, the whole thing would collapse if it came down to just one person, right? I mean, yep. that's just how it works. I mean, Jesus, it's, it's in Hamilton. <laughs> it's in Hamilton, right? When 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 right. when Lee, Colonel Lee runs, right? And, 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 and George Washington says to Hamilton, get Lafayette. <laughs> I mean, they put it in a fucking musical, <laughs> you know, that's, right. that's the system. We trained, we changed battalion commanders. Who's the Colonel, which, uh, which is the, the head guy next to the Sergeant Major, Chuck Fields, great guy. Chuck had retirement papers in, but he stayed. And then they were, they changed command during our deployment to Iraq in 2004 at that point. And, it got, uh, and, and, and uh, Colonel Contriotis came down from division staff and took over our battalion. If you can change commanders in combat and never miss right. a beat. Don't give me this bullshit that changed the sergeant major 10 months before you even deploy for training somehow screwed his unit. It, it no, is, it right. is so painfully it's ridiculous. Political. It is political. Is. And that's why I showed at the beginning that screens. And that's the last thing I want to say before we go to sponsor break, this guy, Sergeant major Barons, he's been on a, and here's why it's so let's be very honest. And then we can, we're political so we can say it. This isn't about veterans, you guys. It's not no. about honor, right? It's about politics, isn't it? And you know, yeah. what's the first well, thing? To, the first time Tim Waltz got involved in politics was 2004. He volunteered for John Kerry's campaign. Now you were around back then. What did that mean back in our time, brother? Actually, I was still on active duty. You back were. Then. Me too. I was the hunter yeah, first. I was, I, I was in Iraq. Um, yep. <laughs> so I was watching from the vantage point. Th- th- those guys didn't pull me in until. Uh, Really, actually, until 2008. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I was in the car. I'm not shitting you, man. I was actually in the vehicle with <laughs> President Bush's staff at Fort Campbell in March of 2004 when he visited Fort Campbell. And they're on the phone talking about John Kerry's service. <laughs> OK, so to come out as a Democrat in 2004 uh, and and that's what this is about, that Tim yeah. Waltz had the temerity and the audacity to come out against the Iraq war and run as a Democrat. And if you look at the things that these guys have said since then, their politics is what was then is now MAGA was much more extreme. It's anti it's homophobic as hell. A lot of his posts are homophobic. He hates the fact that Tim Waltz in the end is liberal. This is about politics, isn't it? Oh, politics. Because yep. if it was about anything else. He he discuss he would discuss issues. Um and he, he may even would discuss his leadership style, but he can't even touch that. Nope. No, nope, he can't touch it. So I, so I, I, you know, so for a lot of us who are who are frustrated with this, and a lot of you viewers who watch the show and don't understand the nuances of the military, let's not get down to the military. Let's be very direct. This is a political hit job on a honorable service member, an honorable veteran who had the temerity and the audacity to be a Democrat in the early days of the Iraq war. That's where this right. comes from. So that's a great place to take a break. We got a lot more to talk about. So let's talk for, let's talk to our sponsors. We got great Roan and Z Bidox are joining us again. We're so happy. Let's come, let's get our sponsors to come right back. If you're like me, you understand the pain of finding out what to wear each day. I mean, most clothes I have are uncomfortable, never actually the size I really am. And not to mention how much time is wasted trying to find a good outfit. And when you do have a good fit, you can only wear it for a few hours. We have to change for an important meeting or dinner, find a new outfit. Now, everyone wants to dress well at all times because simply put, it's a confidence booster, even for men like me. Men's closets were due for a radical overhaul and reinvention, and Roan stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible set of products known to man, and here's why. 
Rowan helps you get ready for any occasion with the community collection, which offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, quarter zips, and polos. You have never have to worry about what to wear when you have the Rowan Commuter Collection. With gold fusion, anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Rowan is 100% machine washable, so you can just ditch it all in the dry cleaner or ditch the dry cleaner completely, put it all in your own washing machine yourself. You know, I'm obsessed with the Rowan Commuter Collection. We're on the move a lot, whether it's I'm catching a flight or I'm going to a meeting or whatever. The Rowan Commuter Collection has never let me down so far. The commuter collection get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to head to roan.com slash Fred. Use promo code Fred to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to R-H-O-N-E dot com slash Fred and use code Fred. It's time for you to find your corner office of comfort. Check out our sponsor, Roan. I hope you'll buy some outfits today. Hey, let's face it. After a night out with drinks, I do not bounce back the way I used to when I was in my 20s as a young officer in the United States Army, full of strength where we drink all night and then go working out the next morning. And lately, it's been not as easy since I'm a grandpa now. That is until I found Z-Biotics Pre-Alcohol. Now, Pre-Alcohol is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by a PhD scientist to tackle rough mornings after drinking. And here's how it works. When you drink... Alcohol gets converted to a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Now, pre-alcohol produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to take, make your Z-Biotics your first drink of the night, then drink responsibly, and you'll feel your best tomorrow. Look, I won't lie. Uh, I don't like hit the clubs anymore. I'm not that guy. But what I do is I take my partner and we go to outdoor concerts here in our town. We will sit down in the heat of the sun in the summer. We'll drink wine. We'll drink beer. And it kind of sneaks up on you. And the next thing you know, you're feeling a little bit on the weather. So I decided to give Z-Biotics pre-alcohol a shot. And man, what a difference. Believe me, it is the real deal. So for vacations, weddings, birthdays, reunions, there's so much going on. Get the most out of your summer plans by stocking up on pre-alcohol now. So it's easy. Go to zbiotics.com slash Fred to get 15% off your first order when you use Fred at your checkout. Pre-alcohol is back with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for, for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So Z, I'm going to go back to it again. Just make sure it's clear. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash Fred. Use the code Fred, F-R-E-D, at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, as always, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode and for the good times you helped me continue to have. All right, we're back. I, you know, we've talked a lot about this situation, Tim Waltz, but let's let's. That's enough of that. I don't want to give any more damn energy to this ridiculous attack on a good, good man. No. What's more important for me, and really, 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 the big reason I want to talk to you, brother, was you know you're currently the co-chair of of the DNC's Veteran and Military Family Council, but you've been involved in Democratic politics on the veterans policy side. You go back to Hillary Clinton. I think you know you've been doing this for a while. Oh, right. You know, I, I get so frustrated because I constantly get attacked on our on online about how the Democrats don't help. You know, don't like veterans to haven't helped the military you know but the truth of the matter is far from that you've been doing this for a long time tell us about the history of, of being involved and in, in the democrats truly trying to address veterans issues in the military so i could say this so many ways the best <laughs> notch and cigars but um we don't have those but yes jim moran said it best um i forget how long ago this was let's just say 15 years ago um at some Arlington County Democratic Committee meeting. And he said, if you want to know how much your elected leaders care about the issues you care about, see how they vote on appropriations yeah. towards those issues, right? Um, and so when I was a surrogate for Barack back in 08, there were times when I would just pull out John McCain's voting record on VA appropriations. Yeah. And every time I'd say legislation this, the title, he would vote no. Listen, yeah. no, no, no. And people would look at me like I was crazy. And I say, this is the contrast to, you know, the people who are supporting Barack Obama. They're voting yes every time. They right. they may not be the loudest cheerleaders. You know, they may not be giving us the the hugs and kisses that we wish we were getting. Hump on the flag. <laughs> you, know, you know, they may not be giving us candy instead of, um, vegetables, but when it comes to appropriating the uh, vote, uh, both writing the legislation 
sponsoring the legislation, passing the legislation, right? President signing the legislation and then properly appropriating the legislation. It's Democrats. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it has been, well, actually it always has been. I mean, that that's probably one characteristic that's maintained since LBJ sacrificed the Democratic Party to get the Voting Rights Civil Rights Act yeah. uh, passed is that at least Democrats maintain their their legislative appropriation support of of of, of, all, of the issues that support us as veterans and military family members, whereas Republicans don't. And was, I mean, you know, probably better than I, because um, you're well. I guess it's both our jobs to yeah, know. But it is. Trump, Trump's goal is to gut the VA, like literally. Yeah. Um, you know, his, his goal during his, his first term was to, to do what he could to privatize the, the entirety of VA healthcare. And that would destroy us. I mean, I mean, you and I have obviously our mutual friend, cause we're not just having a one-on-one conversation with Ron Steptoe yeah. and the work that they're doing. Like that would totally devastate that type of work because the civilian, the, the civilian sector is not prepared to, to take on the rest of us who are, um, who who have the issues that we have because of our service. Yep. Um, but that, that is what it is. Um, and so it's, it, it's really dis- disparaging that folks can't um, create that correlation or see the correlation between our military service and being a Democrat. Yeah. And they think that, that if we wore the uniform and we're a Democrat, then we're some type of weird unicorn, but yep. an ugly weird unicorn. And they expect us to be a Republican, but then when Republicans meet us, they're like, what's wrong with you? Yep. But those, the ones who are saying it don't understand that legislative appropriation piece because they're so accustomed to getting the hugs and the kisses, but not peeling back a la- the layer of the onion and saying, oh, these Republicans who I'm supporting aren't supporting me. Right. You know, I saw it, you know, I was a Republican voter. I was never a political operative, but I was a Republican and I grew up here in Missouri. That's how it was. And, uh, and I'll be honest. I tell the story very honestly. When, when I know when when uh, Mrs. Obama and Dr. Biden launched joining forces. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, when Barack Obama took office, um, the first lady and the second lady joined together to create a thing called joining forces. Not about two, three years into their, their term, and or two years. And it was a it was designed to help veterans and military families and military members in their transitions, jobs, just to highlight the thing. And I'll be very honest, I was incredibly skeptical. I thought it was a trick, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then I stumbled into help working with them. I, I my I had a company at the time that started, did veterans advocacy, and we ended up work with them. I ended up helping them. I, I, I was actually one of the last acts of joining forces under Mrs. Obama was they had a homeless veterans convening right in the White House. And they brought mm-hmm. corporate, they brought Home Depot, they brought the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans. Both of those were clients at my time. And they cared and they re- actually physically reduced the number of unemployed. The unemployment rate for veterans at the start of the Obama administration was unbelievable. It was as high as 13 percent for some categories of veterans at that point in 2008. And by the time right. they left office, it was three points on average average uh, 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 like three points below the national average of unemployment that took hard work and that talked leadership by the democratic administration by the democrats on top of the gi bill on top of things and now let's talk about just the last three years the biden administration and the harris administration have done a lot the pact act which is now two years old right brother i mean tell people about what the pact act is and why it's so important that it got passed by well, democrats I mean, the PACT Act is so important and you you can appreciate this, Fred, because, you know, these guys were your instructors when you were at school. Yeah. Um, you know, th- th- this, this, uh, this fight began with, you know, Vietnam vets, right. Uh-huh. Because of Agent Orange and, you know, good, good guys like Steve Robinson, oh. unfortunately passed away too long, you know, too early. Great guy. Um, you know, leading this effort with Vietnam veterans of America and trying to get, you know, uh, just basic healthcare services for our Vietnam vets who were exposed to Agent Orange or, or, or maybe possibly were, right? And that's where this all began. And so obviously you fast forward to, you know, President Biden having, having a personal uh, connection with, you know, with this because of, of, of Bo's cancer. And, you know, Bo's not the only person who I know who mysteriously got cancer after a deployment in Iraq. Yep. And you know, maybe it was burn pits. Maybe it was that funky dust that got raised up because the earth had never been moved for 2000 years until our tracks yep. ran through. Um, we don't know. Right. But we do know the environment and what we were breathing was causing cancer and causing folks to die from the cancer. 
And because of that work that the Vietnam vets had laid, and because of those of us who served in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, and East Africa, and all points in between and outside, and recognizing the importance of taking care of us. Yep. Right? I mean, that was, I mean, this was one of the mantras that we stated during President Obama's campaign was the continued service piece. Right. And if we come in 100%, and mm-hmm. Dr. Evelyn Lewis, who you know, so we come in like 100% healthy and we're getting out of the military 50, 60, 100% broken. It's not because we were jumping off rooftops when we wanted to. It's because we were jumping off rooftops because we were told to or because we were standing next to burn pits like I was literally yep. um, to increase soldier morale for the guys who had to do it, right? Uh, or we were doing whatever, doing the mission, right? And so this PACT Act is is so serious um, and so important uh, even to those who aren't able to directly benefit a good story. Um, I was talking to the uh, director, executive director of CBC a few weeks ago, and um, Congressman Clyburn was down in his district, let's say two months ago, and it could have been three months ago, but some time ago uh, this year. And um, to truncate the story, a woman came up to him and thanked him for working with President Biden to get the PACT Act signed and so forth. And you know, she'd gotten or she'd gotten uh, her, her benefits had increased. Her husband had already had, had already passed some years ago, yeah. but uh, the benefits had transferred to her and she had noticed a, a bump in, in her benefits on, you know, two years ago, yeah. right? A year and a half ago. <clears throat> and after, you know, conversing with, with the Congressman, um, the Congressman is talking with his staff later that day or the next day or so. And he put the pieces there. So, oh, she got additional benefits because of the PACT Act. Wow. You know, and though, yeah, obviously it would have been nice if if uh, they could have had that money decades ago as they had earned. But, you know, the beauty of this is at least we're acknowledging that there were health. Um, I can't even think of the right SAT word, but, you know, health negative health things happening yep. to us yep. because of our service. Yep. Right. We may have volunteered to serve, but if we have to put ourselves in harm's way, it is the duty of those who deploy us or cause us to deploy to take care of us afterward. That's it. And for me, the impact has been incredible. I mean, first with the first, the, you know, the Republicans actually stopped the pact at the first time it was tried. They, they, there's great, there's yeah. video of, of Ted Cruz high-fiving Josh Hawley stand there high-fiving because they killed the bill that was supposed to help veterans. When it finally passed, thanks to the hard work of you and, and our VSO partner, the veteran service organizations and John Stewart, for God's sake, and a hundred other people, uh, John Tester, starting John Tester's running for reelection. They worked their asses off and people like Tim Waltz to get this thing passed the second time two yeah. years ago. And now, over a million veterans have been added to the roles at the VA. Now, let me tell you a significant as for those who don't understand. There's only about 16 million living veterans today, and that's dropping dramatically as the World War II and, and Korea veterans are dying off. That's that's a lot. That's not the main people. In the entire country of 333 million people, less than 16 million, 50 million ever served in the military. It's 6 to 7% at any one time. At any given time, at most, 9 million of those veterans were actually enrolled for their benefits, be it pay or their health care uh, at the VA. So anywhere around 50 to 60 percent. In two years, they've enrolled a million new veterans into the system. That's such a significant number. It's hard to fathom how big it is. But for me, my personal experience has been more than that. Under the Biden-Harris administration, they fixed the VA. We've had one VA secretary. We've had very little change. We don't have the Mar-a-Lago three friends of President Biden <laughs> like they did with Trump, where he had his buddies, Ike Perlmutter and others, literally as informal and now we know now illegal advisors to the VA secretary. The secretary of the VA was reporting to Tom, Donald Trump's buddies from his golf club, okay, at one point. And the, because of that, we're doing more. What I was shocked about, and, and then we'll move on, is I was part of the, they, they reached out to creators like me and said, hey, they actually flew into D.C. and said, hey, come here. We're going to brief you on the PACT Act. We want to get more people signed up. They did an effort to actually get the word out to veterans that there was a deadline where they could actually sign up. <clears throat> and if they qualify for PACT Act, it would be backdated all the way to the day the law was passed. So I was right. part of that. So I didn't sign up because I didn't think I had burn pit stuff. But somebody finally talked me. One of my soldiers from Iraq talked me into signing up. Well, you know what? This is what's fascinating to me, and we'll move on, is when I went into the VA website, <clears throat> I first signed up for my benefits when I retired in 2010. It was laborious. I mean, holy crap. Forms. I understand. Trust remember, me. man? Yeah. You, you remember. <clears throat> forms, 
paper forms. You had to get somebody to help you. And I ended up with 50% disability. <clears throat> Flash forward 2024. I go on their website. It says, hey, we've upgraded our website. Now, if you want to upgrade your disability, separate from the PACT Act, you can do that here. Man, I signed up. I did all of my own paperwork on the VA's website. I hit send on, and I'll be, I'll be honest. I'm very honest about my experience. I, I'd never signed up for PTSD. I was diagnosed with my PTSD after I left the service. I did my own paperwork. I filled it. I hit send. Two days later, the VA, a contractor called me and booked all of my appointments with their medical professionals to be evaluated. And I was approved for all the way up to 100% disability within three months. And, and not only that, the VA themselves called me because I'd screwed up the Gulf War Center part, <laughs> okay? Right. I'd filled it out wrong. A person from the VA called me personally to say, hey, you filled this form out wrong. I want you to do it this way and then resubmit it. I mean, folks, if you understand anything about the VA, this is not your daddy's VA. This is not Fred's oh. VA. I mean, this is not the VA from 2010. This is what the Biden-Harris administration has done in three years is such a dramatic change in our relationship with our veterans, it's hard to fathom unless you're an insider and understand that. So I tell that personal story because I am one of the people who was benefited from these massive changes because I had never put in for it. And they were very well, to caring. Your point you know? too, Fred, it's not the VA that Republicans, that traditional Republicans won either. So mm -hmm. I was being considered to be the undersecretary of the VA for benefits wow. um, in this administration. And a good friend of ours, Ed Marr, um, help me help set up a bunch of meetings for me so I can, you know, get some institutional knowledge um, before moving on to, you know, other phases of the interview process. And I happened to meet with two former VA secretaries under the first Bush administration. I don't recall their names. It is what it is. Yeah. Um, and these dudes. And so I said to them, it's difficult enough with the internet to get your VA benefits. I couldn't imagine what it was like when it was all paper. Yeah. They both of these guys said to me, well, that's the intent. It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be hard for veterans to get their benefits. So I'm looking at these guys. Unfortunately, my grandmother trained me on how to have <laughs> with old people, i.e. I quickly changed the subject so we yeah. continue so we could continue having a good conversation. But I I looked at these guys and I can't I honestly don't understand your thinking because in a perfect world, the last the 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 last out processing desk should be the VA desk. Yep. Right. But it's not. But fortunately, to your point, it's so much easier now than it used to be uh, to imagine that anyone would want it to be even harder or as hard as it used to be just boggles my friggin' mind. We can't go back. That's right. We're not going no. back, right? That's it. So looking forward, I know I've got a little bit of time with you left. We're heading to Chicago next week. You'll be having at least two, two meetings of uh, of the, the Veterans and Military Families Council. What are your plans for the DNC? And what are you guys looking at for policies you want to recommend to what will be the harris Waltz administration? <laughs> so fortunately, um, because uh, Vice President Harris worked closely with President Biden, with much of both national security and uh, yeah. national security defense and VA uh, issues, um, the policies that 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 we wrote and I assisted in, in some of the final in the finalization of, of much of that yeah. um, transfers to her. So obviously we you know we had to personalize it for her and highlight some of the aspects of things that um, she worked more closely with than 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 some other things. Uh, and so for me, it's it's to your point the Pact Act and you know and um, highlighting that it's. Um, it's her work on the national security piece, especially when it comes to um, our support in Ukraine against Russia. Yeah. Um, you know, and just highlighting, you know, her role in, in supporting Ukraine and, and our Eastern European allies primarily um, for that. Um, and then just getting her across the finish line and, and having people on standby to uh, prepare policy for the transition so that. Uh, when she's written, when she wins and we start transitioning and she, you know, raises her right hand in January, we're ready to rock and roll. Yeah. And and to have an actual veteran on the ticket who has, and here's the, and that's the last thing I'll talk about as far as this, 
it's, it's so huge. important. It's huge. And and the thing is, the great thing about Tim Waltz that's amazing is he isn't just a veteran. He went from the National Guard to Congress and ended up and, and that the, the now look, the executive director of AMVETS. So if you don't understand AMVETS, AMVETS is one of the what we call the big six VSOs. And to be candid, they tend to run on the right side of things. <laughs> Let's be honest, right? AMVETS tends to run on more of the right side of things. <laughs> you said it. Uh, yeah, I know. Everybody knows this. You know, it, it's an right. unspoken thing. Of the six, they're, they're the ones a little bit more uh, obvious. The executive director of AMVETS put out a statement saying that in his 25 years, Tim Waltz was one of the most powerful veterans advocates we've ever had in Congress, right? For a fact. For a fact. And, yeah. and he still is. He still is. Hyperbole. You know, right. It's not even, it, and I remember when I ran my company, Scoutcoms, he was still in Congress. That's a fact. He he was, he worked really hard. He w- cared. He went on. This is the thing we don't talk, the funny thing about this whole thing about him never going to Iraq is he did as a congressman, he, he went on fact-finding trips to Afghanistan right. and Iraq. He looked at how we evacuated our soldiers. He was very concerned about the medical process of somebody coming out of the, the war zone and getting them to Walter Reed, et cetera. So, so to have a guy who's actually been in the muck with us, uh, both physically and, and, and as a soldier, but even more so as a congressman who drove a lot of this legislation, I think it's going to be a very powerful tool for you, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's huge. I mean, yeah. going, you know, you going back to his, his time in Congress, I mean, one of my close buddies from high school and West Point was his chief of staff. Oh, OK. Right? Well, there you have um, it. And then, you know, you kind of hit on it, too, earlier in the conversation. And people don't understand, like, the mentality of a senior of, of an NCO. Yeah. Right. Like the fact that she chose a senior NCO to be her VP is so friggin' perfect. Yeah. I, I don't even think she truly understands the strength of what she got and in picking a, a retired senior NCO. Yeah. Cause I don't know about you, but my army time was, it was all about my NCOs. Like they had my back in ways that again, scotch and cigars. Um, like those were my dudes. Um, and so for her to have someone supporting her as her right hand who understands what that type of leadership is supposed to look like. Yep. And how it's supposed to act, it's it's friggin' phenomenal. And it, it, it this could be a extremely great next four years, um, with with that team together. Oh, it's so true. And that was I'm so glad you brought that up because that's a great place to end the conversation. Is that was my first thought. See, here's the thing. You know, the problem with a lot of folks that become vice, it's a hard job. Vice president's a tough job. You're number two. Your job is to go to funerals. <laughs> Every no, it's not it's not the greatest job. You know, if you watch Veep. The problem with Veep is it's a little bit too close to true sometimes, you know, it's a tough job. But the thing about being a senior NCO, a first sergeant, a platoon sergeant, a sergeant major, command sergeant major is your job is to make that commander their job successful. Your right. job is to make sure things are running smoothly. You you may not be the superstar. You're the number two. It's it's like being the bridesmaid for the rest of your life. But that's the best part. That's why they literally created a position called senior enlisted advisor, the chairman, so that the yeah. chairman, even the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, would have that guy who can walk in his office and say, "Hey, boss, we got a problem." Or, hey, boss, good, <laughs> right? I mean, and that's yep. what they did. And so to get an actual senior NCO to be the VP, and when you look at the way he looks at her in a professional manner. I, they, I saw a video, like this has got a video coming out today of them talking. That's what I and, see. And did you see, right? You saw it, right? Yeah. It's like, it's the Colonel, Vice President Harris, and the Sergeant Major with the, his body language. And yeah. I, I tell you, America, you got to elect these guys because you're going to see something magical that you know, never, normally Americans don't see, which is this wonderful relationship between the senior NCO and the commander. And, and, and this time, this time it's the senior NCO and the commander in chief so what a great place to end this conversation brother i am so happy for you thanks for coming on here so short notice and and i can't wait to see you in chicago hey thanks for having me yeah we're gonna have some fun next week <laughs> can't wait all right we'll talk to you soon my friend good luck man what a great conversation with a great american of course fellow west point grad i hope you didn't get too much west point lingo there <laughs> um i want to circle back to a story that's very personal to me um that 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 taryn reminded me of we'll talk about this relationship between the senior NCO and the commander. So for those who've watched my show for one, you know me, if you watch my social media, you may know that I lost my first wife, Jennifer, uh, and child in a car accident in 1994, in September 1994, which is coming up, um, the anniversary is coming up, and it was very tragic. So, But here's the rest of the story that I've never probably told, I don't know if I've ever told it publicly. So the story is, I was actually in a meeting at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, 
um, at our, our hangar when when her accident, her car accident occurred in Clarksville, Tennessee. And we were in the meeting. We were sitting there getting ready to brief. We had a brand new battalion commander, which you may f- be familiar now with. That. That's Lieutenant Colonel. He was our, our boss. He was actually the incoming guy. And we were having a meeting, talking about upcoming training. And this guy was a bit of a, well, a dick. We'll just put that. In. <laughs> so it was a very stressful meeting. In the middle of the meeting, he got called out by my boss, my old boss, um, a guy named Major Bill Gillen, who I'll say I'll name check physically because Bill Gillen saved my life. So Major Gillen called out Lieutenant Colonel out in the hallway for something. So we took a break. I went out to get myself a Diet Coke out of the out of the because uh, that's what I do. Need my caffeine, and they said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm going to get a drink." They said, "Well, we need to talk to you," and they brought me into what was then what we call our flight planning room, which is a huge room. A sort of small room for the pilots where we have a huge map of the region, the local, our flying areas and all that kind of stuff. And that's where we used to plan our flights. And the whole room was full of people. And the chaplain was there, which is never good. If you're a soldier, you know, when the chaplain's in an unexpected meeting, it's never fucking good news. So they sat me down in a chair and looked me to, Bill Gillen squatted down in front of me and he said, there's been an accident. And I said, Jennifer, he says, yes, she didn't make it. And I said, the baby. He said, no, the baby didn't make it either. And I collapsed. I fell out of my chair. I ended up on the floor. And all hell broke loose because this new colonel was there. He started yelling, has this been confirmed? What are we doing here? You know, chaos. I mean, I just remember chaos. People were talking over me. (laughs) And I run, the funny part is, I was a company commander at the time. I had a, a what was called a headquarters company. I had 120 soldiers in the 101st Airborne Division. And I had a first sergeant, senior NCO, like Tim Waltz. Somehow, I ended up sitting on the floor with my back against the wall as these people, these soldiers, fellow soldiers, argued <laughs> over my situation. My first sergeant sat down next to me. And he said, what are you doing? And I was in shock, as you know. If you ever talk to someone who was in shock, you kind of get woozy. And my first sergeant, who was a big, big black man, big hulking figure. That was the best part because I could use him because he was so big, much bigger than me. First sergeant stands up and says, everybody shut the fuck up. This captain needs help right now. We're leaving. And he physically picked me up by the shoulders and duck marched me out of the room to a car and whizzed me out of there. That's what a senior NCO does. So that day of chaos, when all hell was breaking loose, when I needed help, my first sergeant, you know, my, my senior NCO, like Tim Waltz, was the guy who cut through the fucking bullshit and took care of me as the commander and ensured that my morale my health and safety was his number one priority that's the gift we're getting when tim waltz becomes vice president of the united states we're getting someone who has spent 24 years of life understanding soldiers needs understand the needs of his boss the commander in chief in this case and will put their welfare ahead of his own to ensure that they are taken care of that's the gift of the possibility of having the first guy who ever served as a command sergeant major in the United States Army, to be the number two guy, the literally vi- the command sergeant major of the country. And I tell you that very, very personal story that actually causes me to choke up when I tell it, because you need to understand the gift of having someone with that experience on our ticket, on the Democratic ticket. So when you see people like J.D. Vance, Donald Trump, the scumbag who had five draft deferments and fake bone spurs, who never served a day, has spit on our service, called us suckers and losers, says he doesn't understand why anyone would do it. When you have that as your opponent, you have a vice president nominee who chose to attack a fellow veteran, a vice president nominee who served one tour, one enlistment, to attack another veteran openly because of his damn politics. The contrast is clear. And I tell you that personal story because I need you to understand the gift that we've been given with the experience of Tim Waltz. And all the stories I hear about him, I can picture him being that guy that would have lifted me out of that room in my time of need. To have that person in the room with Kamala Harris 
as she's thrust into the nomination for the Democratic presidential nomination, as she raises her right hand on January 20th of, the, of next year to become the commander in chief of the United States in a whirlwind transition, to know there's going to be somebody standing there also by her side who's been that guy gives me such peace of mind about this ticket. It's unfath unfathomable. So I take that very personal story. I hope you understand why I told it. Um, I don't share those kind of things very often, but I want you to know where we're coming from as veterans and service members when we talk about this. It's very personal to us. These attacks are very personal to many of us. Keep that in mind. With that, I'm not gonna take much more of your time. It's been a great, great show. Taryn's a great guy. I will be at the DNC next week as one of the 200 credential creators. I'm hoping to give you a lot of content. <laughs> we haven't figured out what our show is going to look like next week. Matt and I are, you know, I don't, we'll figure it out. I hope by Friday we'll have a show. I don't know. <laughs> we will, I don't know what the hell going to look like. I don't know what's going to, I have no idea what's going to happen. I know I'm getting invited to some really cool shit. My hope is to get some interviews with some really cool people. And Matt back here is going to try and cobble that together in an actual show. I, I, in the meantime, please, please follow on democracy podcast at on democracy podcast on youtube specifically is where most of my content will go of course we'll be providing content to a whole bunch of Midas touch creators ken harbaugh keith edwards politics girl i mean oh my gosh uh Littman, alex mockler i mean there's gonna be so many minus touch uh, contributors there so make sure you follow minus touch all week as well and then i'm very excited i'll be joining my friends at vote vets uh as well to produce content for them through the election i mean it, you're gonna be sick of me i'm sorry but in the meantime you're gonna find a lot of really interesting content from on the ground in chicago i can't wait for you to see it please subscribe to our channel so you get it all originally in the meantime folks we're gonna win this thing we are winning i told you that six months ago most of you thought i was crazy <laughs> we're winning we're winning you got to believe it you got to get on the train but we're not going to win till the, the election's over no breaks all gas put your fire your hope your passion into winning this election and we will win in November and change this country for the good and put the MAGA movement, the hatred, the idea you should smear veterans because they're a service because you don't like it the way they did it in the history books forever. With that, thank you for being here. Thanks for supporting our wonderful little show. We'll see you next week.